During the coffee break, I was asked about more details about the spring string split thing. Um, but I wanted to share that with all of you, just to make it sure. We use string split a lot, and, and <clears throat> let's illustrate this. So let's define, I, I'm putting this in code snips and then uploading that, so um, just to show you. So let's define a vector which contains a single element, which is the three letters A, B, C divided by a colon. And incidentally, when I assign something or have an expression like that, and I put parentheses around it, the effect is that whatever gets inside gets executed, but the whole result also gets printed or is available. So this is basically a shorthand of saying, assign that to x and then show me the contents of x. It's basically done in one line. So if you find things with parentheses around them on, 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 on a line in, in a script, that's what that means. OK, so I have a vector. It contains one element, a, b, c. Um, scalar values, i.e. single values um, assigned to some r object. In fact, r also vectors of length 1. <clears throat> so this is, this is the vector uh, a, b, c. Now, if I do string split x, uh, as we've seen before, it's, we split on the colon we get a vector of three elements, A, B, C, and that vector is contained in a list which contains one element, which is that vector. Now, if I pull that out by using the, the subsetting operator with double brackets, which gives me a single item that I can, I, I can apply to a list, then I get only the vector, and that's normally what I would want to be working with. I get a similar result by saying unlist, because the unlist function takes everything that it finds in the list and puts it into a single vector. So that looks exactly the same. In this case, string split one and unlist, the whole thing, are exactly identical. But now let's consider the case that we don't have a vector of one string, but we have a vector of two strings, or potentially more strings. And the elements in here have different lengths. So now we have a vector. The first element is a, b, c, separated by colons. The second element is d, e, separated by colons. And if we string split that, <clears throat> we now get a list of two elements. The first one has the a, b, c vector, and the second one has the d, e vector. And now it matters whether we use the subsetting extraction or the unlist, because the, unset the subsetting extraction applies only to the first list element, of course. But the unlist applies to the whole thing. And I get A, B, C, D, E. So depending on what the input potential can be and what we want the output to be, either one or the other or both are possible. So that's the difference between the subsetting extractor and the unlist. All right. So we were looking at how to get this into um, <clears throat> as data. Um, we used. We just put the whole thing in the, the whole um, text that we had into a single character element, and we, we split it on the line break character. And then we could either unlist or unsplit it, and we assigned this to the correct, to the correct value. And now, most frequently, though, what you will encounter is, is data that is large and structured in some way. And for that, we, will be, we would be reading it um, with some variant of R's inbuilt read functions. The most frequently used ones are the three read lines. 
read CSV and read DLIM. So read lines produces a vector of lines from a text file one line at a time. <coughs> so in our case, that's exactly what we wanted. So this reads the file. <clears throat> Every single line goes into its own element, and the result is a vector. So we can assign that. We could also use um, the read CSV function or the read delimited function. It doesn't matter because we only have one element per line here. So whether we tell this, whether we consider this to be tab separated or comma separated, it doesn't matter because there's only one element. So that works in almost the same way. Looks quite similar, except that now we don't have a vector, but we have a data frame instead. In this case, um, the data frame is a data frame with a single column. Since we had no header in our file, header is false, our automatically generated a header, a column name here, which is V1. It was read in rows, and we have the same data. Now, if we have that, um, this is a data frame. So um, how do we? How do we change a data frame into a single vector? <coughs> because the specification called for a single vector. You mean take column? Right, we extract the columns. How do we do that? You can literally just call a column and assign it to a vector. Car genes. So we could either just use the column v1 because it's called that, which is the vector we want, or define all rows and the column named v1, which is the same thing. But in this special case, we can actually also use unlist, I think. And we get all the data from the data frame in a single vector. And depending on what that data is, that will determine what the, what the type of the vector is. So all of these three either car genes dollar v1 or car genes v1 or unlist car genes would do the same thing. I could even have used read CSV and then just applied the dollar v1 directly to the function call. I don't need to use an intermediate assignment to a variable. More often than not, however, um, our, our data is going to be two-dimensional anyway, rows and columns of different types, and uh, we'll, we'll just put it into a spreadsheet to begin with. All right. <clears throat> Good, so we've, we've talked about how to get very, very simple data um, into into R. How many genes do we have? How do we know? Right, so here in the environment we see 46 observations of one variable. Um, but it's actually still in the spreadsheet version. 
Let me just change that back to a vector. Right, so it's a character vector of 46 elements. If we wouldn't be looking at that, how do we find it programmatically? Length. The length command gives us the number of elements in a vector. which is something we often need because the length command is also the index for the last element. The index of the first element, of course, is 1. The index of the last element is length of the vector. OK, here's a task. <clears throat> now, um, On the science website, as on any other um, paper websites, there's a section of the article called Supplementary Materials. And if we go to the Supplementary Materials, this lists tables and usually additional method methodical documentation, methodical methodological documentation, um, and, and hopefully other data. In this case, um, table S3 uh, summarizes data that that was underlying one of the plots. I'm, I, I, I need to remember which plot. Anyway, so this is one of the plots um, that they produce. The data contains expression profiles of different cell types under uh, lipopolysaccharide stimulated and control conditions. So these are, these are differential expression uh, data from single cells. Um, so if we find something like that on a website, we, we click on the table. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, we click on it. It gets downloaded to our download folder. You, don't need to do that because I've already put it into the data folder, table s3.xls. And the first task is to open that and try to understand what's in that table and what we would possibly need to do to read the data into R. And um, the second task then is to actually do this to actually read the supplementary data. Now, <clears throat> it's very common to share data in Excel spreadsheet formats. A word on that. Excel is an excellent spreadsheet program. It's really, 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 really bad for statistics. Do not use Excel for statistics. Not only does it make horrible, garish, hard to interpret, and ugly, really ugly plots, really ugly plots, um, it also is often wrong. It actually, it actually has its own idea of statistics that is not quite canonical. Um, there's two links. I hope they still work. Um, practical statistics on Excels and burnsstatistics.com um, that kind of comment on why it's a poor idea to use Excel and statistics. So by all means, use it to to share your data, keep your data, as long as the data doesn't get too large. It's, it's often quite useful. Don't use it for programming. Excel programs are usually messy. And do not use it for statistics. You're learning to use R, and that's the right way to do it with a capital R and a capital W. <clears throat> now, Yeah, see, this is one of the things. Now, um, when you export things, as you should from Excel, <coughs> into something like comma-separated values or <coughs> tab-separated values, you even need to be cautious, because one of the problems of Excel is that it truncates numeric precision. It thinks, you know, all these digits after the comma, you don't actually need them. They're like 
you know, overkill. Why do you need seven digits? Come on. Well, sometimes you do. And whether I do or I do not, I do not want Excel to make that decision. I want to be the one who decides whether to do that. So please, just leave my data alone. And to have it leave my data alone, simply convert all cells to text before export. That will export the actual values that are in the cells and not some interpretation of what what the value is in, in Excel. In principle, um, y there's a package, XLS Read Write, which is available via CRAN, but I'm not actually sure that this is a sound practice. The Excel, um, the default Excel format is, um, is closed. People have reverse engineered it to a fashion to understand what's in these files. It's, there's no guarantee that that's actually correct. Um, and on top of that, Excel spreadsheets can be complicated. They have multiple um, sheets. Their values can be um, explicit. They can be implicitly calculated from formulas. Um, you, can, you can mix various tables on the same page. So actually using a function like XLS write is calling for trouble. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you see what you are exporting and export that into a plain text comma separated value or tab separated value format. Make things explicit. I can't overstate that. It's really, really important to keep explicitly track of what your data is doing, validate every single step, and exporting from Excel is no, is no uh, exemption. So what we do is we open our Excel spreadsheet and then we export this as a .csv file, a comma separated value file. And then we'll read it into R. So your task is to um, open the data table like you would usually download it from the supplementary materials on a, on a paper website and then save it in a comma separated value format. And when you have that file, put up a blue post-it. And if you're stuck on that, uh, put up a red post-it.
So I see only a very small number of, uh, of blue post-its. I hope that doesn't mean this is difficult. <laughs> This is the table when I read it in Excel. It's kind of largish, has a lot of data, has a few header lines, file, save as, format, many options here. I want comma separated values, CSV. Um, the alternative tab delimited, text. That's something we usually call a TSV file. However, if you, if you um, get Excel to write tab delimited text f for some reason, it insists on calling it TXT and not TSV. And if you call it TSV instead, it adds .txt to your TSV extension <laughs> anyway. <laughs> we shouldn't be too, uh, getting to uh, frisky and saving things, apparently. Anyway, so CSV actually generates CSV, so I choose table 3.csv. I click on save. It complains again, this workbook contains features that will not work or may be removed. Don't do this. It may, be, it may hurt your little brain. And No, 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 continue. And then it finally... Um, it, it finally uh, saves that. Incidentally, it now calls this file, which I've read before as an Excel file by that name because I've saved it. However, if I simply press save, I believe it changes it back into an Excel format anyway. So Excel does lots of things that I'm not explicitly asking it to do. Um, <clears throat> so I'll throw this away. I just call it differently. So there it is. What's inside? Always look what's in your data before you work with it. Um, it's a text file. It has information at the top. Um, it's comma separated. Uh, so we should be able to read it with uh, an R function called uh, read.csv. And um, what I'd like you to do, your task is to read the table into R, assign it to a variable, and there's a, there's a, there are a few caveats. Use the read.csv function. After you read it in, use the head function to look at the beginning of the object to see what you have and whether that's what you want. There may be header rows that you don't want. There may be um, odd names in the headers that you don't want. So give the resulting object um, column names that reflect the, that reflect the cell type, um, just like in figure uh, 2C of the paper. So here we have different cell types, B cells, macrophages, 
natural killer cells, monocytes. Um, PDCs are what dendritic cells? Po poly. Hmm? Oh, plasma cytoid dendritic cells. Um, the abbreviations that the paper uses are BMF for macrophages, NK for natural killers, MO for monocytes, PDC, DC1, and DC2. So it's a good idea to use these column names, but um, as the, the header possibly explains, some of these are controls and some of these are lipopolysaccharide stimulated. So distinguish CTRL and LPS conditions in your column names. And call the last column cluster because they've clustered the cells and um, the numbers in the last column uh, correspond to the cluster identifiers. There's a function here. Um, which is loaded. It's called uh, object info, <clears throat> which takes a few of the um, data items we can we can retrieve for um, for an object and uh, prints them out to the screen. So once you've read it in or in between, you can use object info whatever your object name is, um, to find how many rows you have, how many columns you have, what the column names are, and so on and so on, what the column types are. Do you have strings? Do you have factors? Uh, are they numeric? Which ones are numeric? And so on. And, and validate that. And um, Yeah, what I omitted to say is, I should add that in here. Call the final object LPS dat. <clears throat> Do call it LPS dat because uh, we'll be refer referring to that variable name in later parts of the script often. You're, of course, free to call it anything you want, but then you will need to edit a lot of the lines in, in the script in order to make them actually work. If you call them LPS dat, um, that's, what's actually, that's what's expected here. Right? So, again, the task is read your CSV file and make sure that what you get as a result of your read operation is actually something that's useful to work with the genes in that file, the expression values, and with uh, appropriate column names. When you're done with that, put up a blue post-it. If you run into trouble and you can't, you can't uh, continue then put up a red poster. Uh, why would this one be faster? I don't know. 
that's what we like, like, the like, oh. like, oh. oh. yes. It's, yeah, it might be such a But it's so, giving some, like, strange. Uh, so it gives you a tibble, so it's a different kind of like, object that's not a Shakespeare object. So, I mean, it's, 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 you don't need it. Um, you work with it the same, a lot of it's all the same. It just gives you extra information. It may be faster, but um, with data this size, like it's milliseconds of speed change, so I don't know if it's going to be that important for them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 Ye
this part is not Why is this? I mean, how is it all the time? I want to make sure this one is not set up. Some of them aren't named because of the way it split the oh, I mean, all the areas of the headers. It's always like this. Mm -hmm. um, so it has one header here that one really is called them. Okay. So you know what I would do is I would just fix it all in the cell and then read it in because it's like, I don't know how to do that. That would be so much easier, but I don't know if you're skip that line. That's not possible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So if we have that in full Oh, yeah, so you need to have some uh, comment character character. So it means you put a character string as the argument for that. Oh, or yeah. blank lines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Logical. I think you put a character as um, so right. Oh, like base. Okay. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. But I have to Yeah. I'm not sure if that. Yeah. Uh, which one? Yes. That's right. So I'm just Because in the original file. So this is what Excel looks like. Right. So I would assume each one of these would go in as a separate row type, right? Yeah. But when I put head table as three comma one, yes. So you have the wrong thing. Then I get this. Like so this one is like is different from just this. So maybe the next row is like So, so let's discuss a little bit of, of uh, what's been happening here. Um, so one thing that that you've probably noticed is trying to read in this, this header from uh, information in a sensible way doesn't really work. Um, it's extremely hard to, to somehow try to recover usable information from a header that's built like this. This was not made to be uh, programmatically used. This, this was uh, someone's idea of how to um, fluff it up for visualization. Um, so what I would do as a, as a strategy is I would just skip reading these first six lines. There's a the skip parameter in read.csv. Uh, start reading line 7, uh, tell read.csv that this file actually does not contain a header, otherwise line 7, i.e. your first data line, will be interpreted as column headers and uh, lost from your data. So skip the first six, uh, start reading line 7, tell it that columns, that this has no header, and then after it's read in, simply Give it a vector, and you'll probably just need to write that out by hand, what the elements are, and assign that to call names of, of your data frame. Can you go through the next line where you assign row names? Yeah. I've not done it like that before, so I'm just curious what your... <clears throat> well, um, well, we'll get to that in a moment. So. Maybe I'll just walk through the, the sample solution here. So if we take the whole thing and and assign that to some raw data, um, header is false and strings as factors is false. Many of you have omitted or forgotten or not realized that you really have to say strings as factors as false in, in something like this here. Otherwise, we get factors all over the place. In particular, if you're reading the whole thing, the first elements are text elements anyway. So this means that the entire numeric data column is also converted into factors, and we need to recover from that. 
Anyway, so this gets messy. Just tell it strings as factors as false, and then we'll, we'll, we'll clean it up later. Um, if we look into that, this is, this is where things go wrong. R automatically assigns V1, V2, V3, or I've seen X1, X2, X3, apparently. Um, cell type, cell treatment, this is where our actual data starts. So um, <clears throat> all columns are named V something or X something. Rows 1 to 6 do not contain data. There's not a single row that could be used as column names. And all columns are characters. So this all needs to be fixed. So the first thing we do is we drop the first six rows in that case. What I'm illustrating now is how, how do I recover from a sloppy read? We can, also, we can read this in a more intelligent way, which saves some of that work. But how do we recover here? So then we just drop the first six line with a negative, um, with a ne negative range. Remember that for subsetting, negative indices remove um, items from the output. Be very careful. Um, the parentheses here are absolutely necessary. So what I have here is one, two, six, which is minus one, minus two, minus three, minus six. Um, if I don't use the parentheses, what does this give me? It's this here, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's not intended. Be careful. In this case, the parentheses are really, really important. <clears throat> it's one of the cases of operator precedence. Um, the, the minus has higher precedence than the expansion, the colon character. So the minus applies to the one before everything uh, is turned into a range. If you, like me, cannot, for saving your life, remember operator precedence, then just put in parentheses everywhere where there's potentially a conflict. Um, if you don't want to remember that uh, operators of, <coughs> of, of, of um, equal priority are evaluated from left to right, or you don't want to remember whether exponentiation is evaluated before multiplication or after that, that kind of thing. Just put things into parentheses. Having parentheses never hurts, I think. I can't remember a single case where um, it would cause problems. So we remove that. Let's see what we got here. So we start with our row seven, but things are still messy. Um, then we define uh, column names. As I said, now here we, we just have to do this by hand. If we're very savvy about how to use the paste function, we could make our lives easier and, and um, uh, paste that together in a way where we don't actually have to spell it out um, line by line. Um, but this is very explicit. And if we put this into our scripts, uh, it has the advantage that we can also comment what we actually have here. So gene, gene names, cell types are taken from figure four of Haitian et al. Cell types are B for macrophages. Control and LPS refer to control and LPS challenge. OK, so this defines my column names. <clears throat> and um, my column names now are here, b.control, b.lps, mf.control, mf.lps, and so on. And <clears throat> Now, there's one thing about this. Since I have deleted the first six lines, note what the row name of my first line is. Seven. Mm. 
So the row names were generated when the file was read. By default, if there's nothing else specified, the row name is the same as the index of the row. Well, almost the same because an index is a number, but a row name is a string. Right, so these look like numbers, but they're actually the, the, the number seven, the number, uh, the, the, the letter seven, the letter eight, the letter nine, the letter one zero, and so on. So these are strings. And when I delete things from my, from my data set and I subset things, the row names don't get changed. So now my row names are from seven to whatever. Now that's very surprising. If I want the first row and I use uh, a row name of one, um, that doesn't actually exist. There is no row name one now. The row name is seven. So to keep the row names which will be printed out when I do a print statement of some <coughs> columns, to keep them aligned with the row indices, I re-index the rows. This is why I set row names LPS dat to one the range from one to n row of LPS stat. And I do that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as it ought to be. <clears throat> now, a residual problem here is that all of these things are still characters, and I need to change them into numbers. I can't just go and do that with one expression, at least not with, with an expression that I would be discussing here. You, you could do it with an apply statement. So what I do is I iterate over the second to the last column and convert these numbers to numeric values. So LPS dat of the column I is as numeric of what that string was. So if I look at the beginning now, that kind of looks correct. I have genes, I have uh, values of cells, I have rows of the correct name, and I have um, if I str, I see that the first column is a character column of G names, and all the remaining columns are numbers, not factors. So remember, by default, if we don't turn this off, um, the read functions, the, the default R read functions, turn strings into factors. So we always need to use strings to factors is false. Let's talk a moment about factors. So why factors in data frames? What are factors in the first place? When are they useful? Why do we have them? <clears throat> now, factors are special types. Nominally, they're strings, like male, female, or agree, neutral, disagree, or something like that. But underlyingly, they are coded as integers that identify the levels of the factors. So for example, if we have genders, factor M, F, F, M, F, probably a very 50s, 1950s view of what genders could be. Um, <clears throat> as a factor, this tells me I have the values M, F, F, M, F, and two levels, F and M. Now internally, this is coded as two, one, uh, um, yeah, two, one, one, two, one. And the two, one, one, two, one refer to the levels. So second level, first level, first level, second level, uh, uh, first level. Note that the order of the levels doesn't have anything, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the order in which they originally appeared in the vector. May be alphabetic, but it could also be something else. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, if we look in more detail, the structure of this is five numbers and two levels. Especially if the levels are long information, this can be useful and compress the data uh, a little bit. Um, we can also define ordered factors in some way. And, you know, if we have something like um, agree, neutral, disagree, these are not random in the ordering, but agree is stronger than neutral, is stronger than disagree, or ordered in some way. And if we want to, to use with data in that way, we set the parameter ordered equals true when we, um, when we define them. And we can define levels. So in this example here, sample grades, I have a grade of G1, G3, and so on. I can define levels G1, G2, G3, G4, and I can tell this is I can tell it that this is ordered. Um, now my sample grades are what I define it to be. And note the level string now. G1 is less than G2, is less than G3, is less than G4. This is how you identify that this is an ordered factor. And when you use factors, for example, in regression analysis to regress over factors, i.e. see whether your values correlate with some categorical um, variable that you have coded as factors, um, then it's important to keep this order intact for the regression analysis. Can you give a specific example of what that might look like in data? Like? Like why you would have? Well, like this here, we have quality grades in, in, in some kind of analysis. Okay. Um, my pathologist tells me that the samples we have, uh, some were decayed pre pretty badly and some are very fresh and then we could perhaps order them. Okay. Or, you know, tumor classification might be one example here. Uh, the more uh, um, uh, severe the, the diagnosis the, or the more uh, the worse the prognosis is in a tumor, you might order it, uh, the factors along this way. Yeah. But depending on what you, want, want, what you want to do, you could order them this way or that way. It's free in, in <clears throat> for how you define it. So they're useful and because they also support a number of analysis methods, such as keeping box plots in order or calculating um, regressions. I've linked to uh, a factor tutorial and a discussion on their use. Uh, one is by uh, Jenny Bryan, who also teaches. Jenny also teaches for us, right? She hasn't taught since I started, but. Uh, or or at, at times. So she's, she's quite active in, in uh, she's in Vancouver and quite active in the R uh, community. Um, now, for our purposes, and I think everything that we're going to be discussing in this workshop, the default. Um, behavior of R to treat all strings as factor is, is just unwanted and needs to be turned off. So we just, when we read something, we always turn uh, something off. And why this happens, I'd, I'd really like to illustrate this again. So if I have a data frame um, that I get from an Excel spreadsheet and the first value was not available, so in my Excel spreadsheet, somebody has typed n slash a, not available. And then the rest is numbers, and I read that into a data frame. Sorry, wherever this says type info, I just forgot to change the name. It's now called object info, so just replace that or, or ignore it. Um, Now, this is a data frame. <clears throat> uh, it has a factor of six levels. Um, so it's, it doesn't have numbers. It's a factor because vectors all need to be of the same type. And so everything in here was converted into strings to match this string here. And um, therefore, we, we got a factor. Incidentally, um, that's a common problem with 
with reading CSV files. If someone somewhere in your spreadsheet just put in a single blank character, that's very hard to catch, but it will turn your entire column into strings, not numbers. So once again, whenever you read something in, make sure that you have the right data type. Okay, <clears throat> so can we turn them back into numbers? Um, well, for example, I, I just remove the first NA, and now they're all like one, one, two, three, five, eight. And I'll just turn them into numeric by saying my data frame two is as numeric my data frame one, and see what that gives me. Um, is that correct? Is that the right result? My data frame two? It looks correct, except if you look more closely, then as Francesca noticed, there's no eight. There's actually no four either. In the original data frame, there was no four. So we, instead of one, one, two, three, five, eight, we get one, one, two, three, four, five, which only looks quite similar but would give us an entirely wrong result where we actually to interpret these as Fibonacci numbers. Um, so what just happened? We turned these into numeric, but that just means we're taking the, represent the internal representation of the factors and using these as numbers. And that gives us the wrong result. So if our numbers inadvertently get, con get converted into factors, we can go horribly wrong when we then go and turn that back into numbers. That's one of the most dangerous and in this case really hard to spot. Congratulations. It's really, really hard to see. That's the kind of subtle error that can creep in which can really ruin your day. So what you need to do instead is at first you need to turn it into characters. This gives me the correct characters. So <clears throat> my DF internally as factors are indeed the numbers 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but these are the levels of the factors, not the actual contents of the factors. So if I turn them into character and then turn them into numeric, and then I look at them, I get the 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. So if you ever need to convert something from factor back to what it should be. Turn it to character first. Once you've turned it into characters, as character, whatever the factor is, you can process it further. Either you wanted strings to begin with, then you're done, or you wanted numbers, or you wanted logicals, or whatever, and then cast them to something else. Okay, but then at the end of the day, after everything is said and done, we have um, the LPS dat object. We have genes as characters, um, expressions as numbers, and clusters as integer numbers. Now, if your LPS dat object looks exactly the same, that's good. If it doesn't, um, you can load the one that I have in the data file. So R has a very efficient uh, mechanism to load and save intermediate data. You just save 
whatever objects you want in an R data file, they are compressed. So if it's a large object of, say, textual data, you will be surprised it gets to be a really small and compact uh, binary uh, file on, on, on your computer. And um, to load it back, um, you can simply say something like, data LPS dot R data. Note that we are not uh, specifying the object name. The object name is whatever was saved in our R data file. We're not assigning this. We are reconstructing um, <coughs> something that we've taken out of the workspace. Yeah? This would only be necessary if we had done like the remove because like, right now it is active in our workspace, so we would not do this right now. Right. Yeah. Right. But you know, if I if I would have removed LPS that RM LPS that, and then it doesn't exist anymore, I can simply recreate it by loading my loaded copy, which should look exactly the same, <laughs> because that's how I how I solved it. <clears throat> if your local version of LPS stat looks substantially different, you might want to do this anyway, um, simply so we all have the same file that we'll be working with. That will help us avoid some surprises. Now to work with this, <clears throat> something we always and often and frequently need um, is subsetting. Is there any volunteer um, from yesterday and the day before who would like to teach the next 10 minutes on subsetting? <laughs> Anybody who's, who's really spent a lot of time on the pre-work tutorial on the subsetting part that... <laughs> um, I'm not surprised. <clears throat> so if this is repetitive, this is good. You really need to internalize subsetting. It's really, really crucially important. Any kind of Data analysis, exploratory data analysis starts with reading in data and then subsetting parts of data and comparing data as you need it. So let's re reconsider the, the six uh, different ways of subsetting. And um, what I do here is I'll, I'll just start with a synthetic data set, randomly pick something. Um, and let's see what we get here. I get it. <clears throat> I give things a name. It has a number of legs. Depending on how many legs it has, it can be a fish, a spider, a beast, um, a crab, or a centipede, um, and some values that I've measured on, on my objects here. <clears throat> now, the first thing of subsetting, the simplest thing of subsetting, is subsetting by index. So this is a two-dimensional object. 
Subsetting by index means I specify rows and columns um, in square brackets. If I specifically specify one particular row, one particular column, I get one element, <gasps> spider. If I leave the rows empty, this means all of my rows. This incidentally is the same thing as if I would have uh, said um, that dollar type. Um, if I if I ke keep the first thing empty, I get all rows. If I keep the second thing empty, I get all columns. <clears throat> if we want a particular set of rows and columns, we pass a vector of positive integers. So for example, uh, we can say uh, that C23 and C123. This is for rows 2 and 3, columns 1 to 3. Now any function that returns a vector of integers can be used. Most frequently, we use the range operator. And retrieving ranges of rows and columns from a matrix or data frame sometimes is also called slicing, a slice of a matrix. So that 1 to 4 to 1 to 3 works. But it can also be in reverse order. So if we specify 4 to 1, 1 to 3, we get the same thing, but um, ordered the other way around. Um, we can um, <clears throat> we can subset only even rows or only odd rows, or we can subset only every 100th row or a random sample of 100 rows. So for example, if we have a data file of protein-protein interactions that we download from the strings database and we have something like 500,000 rows in that, and we want to develop some analysis. Um, working with the 500,000 rows might, might not be very efficient, so we might subsample it um, to take only every thousandth row, which leaves us with 500 data items, essentially randomly sampled, which we can then use to develop our analysis before we apply it to an, the entire data set. So especially if your data sets are large, subsampling a small subset randomly um, will be useful for analysis. Sometimes if the data is really, really large and your analysis is really, really expensive, you, you actually have to do that. That's the only way to, to analyze your data. Actually working with a random sample from your data by subsetting. Now the indices don't have to be unique or in any, any particular order. <clears throat> so we can repeat things. So this here repeats the first row three times, the second row two times, and the third row one times. So it doesn't have to be unique. We just think of it as being you know, slices, usually because that's what we most often do. But any, any ordering is, um, is fine. In particular, we can select random subsets with the sample function. <coughs> so sample 1 to n of three elements gives us 634 or 154 or 425 or whatever. And we can, we can do random subsets. Or we can sort the data frame. Now, sorting the data frame works in a somewhat different way than you would expect. You can't just sort the data frame. Um, <clears throat> if you sort a particular set of values, for example, the values in column two, you get the sorted numbers. But what we need to do um, in order to get the data, the entire data frame in the order that we want, um, we don't sort the entire data frame, 
but we look for the order in which we should be presenting our data. That is not the sort function, but the order function. Now, if, you, if we look at the second column, it's in the, it's natively in the, in the order 0840882010.4. If we apply order to that, we get a vector of 1487310 Now, what does that mean? Well, these are the indices of these numbers in which we would need to consider them to get them into a sorted order. So, 1 means 0. 4 means the fourth element, one, two, three, four, which is also zero. Eight is the eighth element, which is also zero. So this is how we get our zero, zero, zero in the ordering. So maybe let's write a slightly smaller example here to illustrate this. So if we have a vector <coughs> 8, 13, 5, and we sort that, we get 5, 8, 13. If we order that, we get 3, 1, 2. So this 3, 1, 2 is the indices of our original vector to get them in sorted order. 3, 1, 2, 5, 8, 13, right? So in order to apply that, the result of ordering to our data frame, this is again just subsetting. Order creates an index vector, and we use an index vector to pull out the rows from our data frame in the correct order. <coughs> so our data frame sorted by number of legs, which is column two, puts this vector into the rows, and then, you know, just columns one, two, three. So now we have them ordered by number of legs. Three fishes, one bird, two beasts, three spiders, and a crab. We could also order them by lexical order of the names, and that would be um, ordering by column one. C, I, J, R, S, S, T, U, W, and X. So ordering is very versatile. If you look at an ordered vector, though, it always takes me a little while to figure out what's going on. So just try to be uh, familiar with that. If you specify a negative index, that element is excluded. So dat minus 1 means the whole thing without the first row. Uh, dat minus n, not the last row, and so on. <clears throat> so that's one thing, positive and negative indices. The second principle of subsetting is um, logical vectors. So instead of indices, we can specify sets of rows or columns by Boolean values, true or false. And if we place a vector of logicals into the square brackets, only the rows or the columns for which the expression is true are returned. So something like this vector here, uh, rows 1, 2, 3, but true only for column 1 and for column 2, and false for everything else, gives me the name and the type of my collected specimen. And you need to take care that the number of elements in your logical vector is exactly the same as the number of rows, respectively, columns. Now, these logical expressions can be, can be combined with the AND and the OR operator. 
Um, and I'm, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. So, subsetting by index, subsetting by logical expressions. How about filtering? Filtering means selecting from a data set depending on what the values are. So if we get all values that are greater than 100, we're filtering our data set. If we filter by string matching expressions, um, we can use the grep or the in operator to subset via string matching. For example, grep, everything in the third column, <coughs> i.e. The, the type that contains an R, tells me um, Types with an R are found in rows 2, 5, 6, 7, and 9. So what are these? Well, I take the result of that. Rep R dat 1, 2, 3. Look at the first three columns, and we see these are spiders, birds, and crabs, all with Rs. Types that begin with C. This is the regular expression special character here at the beginning of a string, a C, are crabs. I also define centipedes, but none, no centipedes happen to end up in my collection. And um, yeah, let's see. <clears throat> if we use the in operator, um, I'll, I'll review with you how that works and how it, how it does. Then, so we have indices, we have logicals, we have uh, filtering um, by some kind of a logical expression, either grep for string matching or, um, or other logical expressions. Then we have subsetting by name. If row names and column names have been defined, we can use these for subsetting. So for example, I can say rows 1 to 5 of the column called name, or uh, rows 1 to 5 of the column called name and the column called legs. In that case, I, I pass a vector with the row names or the column names. So vectors of row names and column names also work. And finally, the dollar operator. Um, <clears throat> I often use the dollar operator whenever I want to um, extract single columns from data frames. So in this case, if we want to extract the column uh, named legs, I would apply dat dollar legs, one, two, three. Um, so usually in my code, um, I use dollar operators when I want to indicate single individual columns from data frames. Okay, now we have our object um, LPS dat. Let's do something more real worldly. And I'd like, as a task, you to write R expressions that get the following data from LPS dat. Subsetting expressions. The first one is rows 1 to 10 of the first two columns in reverse order. The second one, G names and expression values for LPS stimulated monocytes in the column mo.lps for the top 10 expression values. The top 10 only. Third one, all genes for which B cells are stimulated by LPS by more than two log units. The next one is expression values for all genes whose gene names appear in figure 3B in our data set. Remember, that is uh, 
car genes. So these strings are in car genes. You need to figure out how to subset the LPS data by the genes in here. Hint, this is where you use the in operator. And um, that's it. So these four tasks. Um, in six minutes, we'll be breaking for lunch. Um, you have five minutes to do this. No, actually, it's four tasks, so four minutes should do. Uh, try to get as far as you can. Um, you should not take more than 20 seconds for the first one. The other ones are a little more involved, but also a little more real-worldy. Now, note one thing. I mean, this is, after all, not just an introduction to our workshop. This is exploratory data analysis. So with these operations, we're doing our first exploring data tasks, specifically finding the top 10 expression values from a large data set. So this is the kind of thing that, that you would do when you, when you actually explore your data. And we'll get to something else very soon.
So we're already imposing on our lunch break. Don't feel compelled or obliged to remain. Well, if you feel compelled, then do it. If you feel obliged, no, no such thing. Um, you need a break. You need to ventilate your brain cells from time to time. So um, I'll, I'll see you back after lunch or you.